morning. ¿Cómo están? No los oigo. Much better. So I want to let you guys know right now that you guys have a, you guys are in the middle of a contest and you have no idea. New York trended in New York City. Miami trended in New York City on Twitter. San Antonio, who is a fifth of what Miami was, and a fifth, I, I, I can't do math, you guys, so don't take it literally, don't quote me, don't tweet me this at me, was a fifth of the size of New York City, trended nationally. So San Jose, the folks in this room, let's see if we could trend by talking about the work that you guys are doing here in San Jose, the leadership that you're going to meet, and more importantly, the people that you're going to meet. The hashtag is VL Power Summit. Nicole, where are you? Woohoo, Nicole. So Nicole will be the one, is the digital, is the digital person. She's the behind the scenes. She'll be reminding everybody to do the hashtag VL Power Summit. If you have any questions, if you can't find your hashtag, you can look for Nicole. Buenos dias. I have to say that yesterday's energy in the room was exhilarating. It's nice to be back home. I don't know how many folks know, but I actually am from Sonoma, California. And the programs that started from the voter registration to the text messaging campaigns, everything started here in the backyard because I knew my community better than the rest of the country. And so I wanted to experiment here locally. And we were able to take our programs across the country. And to date, from this year, Voto Latino has registered close to a quarter million Latino youth. We have reached over, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, we have reached over, over uh, 55 million households through our PSAs. But more importantly, we created the Power Summit. And it was w literally, it took six years in the making. And I finally found someone who saw and shared my vision and actually knew how to do it. And that is Michelle Mingus-Moore over there. She said, Maria Teresa, we can do the Power Summit. I said, yes, I don't know, that's, that's not my expertise. She's like, but I know how to do it. So Voto Latino's Power Summit grew from one to four under her leadership. So you guys, she has been amazing. And I, please join me in, help in, in thanking her. And I also want to have an opportunity also to thank the rest of the team because they have been here since two o'clock in the morning to make this beautiful, to make it look like something that you guys are not only going to be receptive, but to enjoy. Uh, folks sometimes just think that Voto Latino is really, really big. We're actually 12 people. So we're, we're, we're mighty small, it's like what I like to say. Um, so if you see anyone with a white t-shirt, please you know, just get to know them. If you guys are looking to move to Washington, D.C., we are recruiting. So Michelle's like, oh no. <laughs> no, but we are recruiting. Um, I think half the staff is from the UC system. I am a UC Davis graduate. And we have several Aggies in the house at, back, in <laughs> back in D.C. as well. For the rest of the afternoon, I want you, for the rest of the morning of the day, I want you guys to have an opportunity, again, to get to know each other, not enjoy each other, I'm changing my vocabulary, but get to know each other, and again, network, network, network. Someone in the last conference, San Antonio, came up to me, and he's, you know, he's my contemporary. I just turned 40 this year, I'm learning about 40, um, and said, you know, I really wish that Volta Latino had been around when I was coming, when I was in college and coming out. And when he said that, it was kind of a, a moment because I realized that all my life's work is to address precisely that. I didn't have a Voto Latino when I was growing up. And I didn't have a Voto Latino in my mid-20s. And Wilmer jokingly said yesterday, Latinos didn't realize that there were millions of us. I was one of those kids. And it's to uh, help address those needs, but more importantly, to see that there is power and strength in our numbers. And we are redefining America. And the more that we redefine ourselves and America, the stronger the country, the stronger the world. So enjoy, uh, enjoy the, the time together. But really ask questions and make sure that you walk away with business cards and follow up with folks. I think we sh can't be shy. We can't, uh, one of my lessons through the journey of Voto Latino was that I had to learn how to ask for help. Um, I don't know about you guys, but in my family, is like, lo que pasa en la familia, se queda en la familia. What happens at home stays at home. And then you realize that if you have problems at home or you are trying struggles, if it only stays at home, you can't build something big. And Voto Latino is, es el esfuerzo de 
tanta gente. It's literally the effort of so many people who believed in the idea and who volunteered and who sacrificed and who joined. Um, there's one person here that I want to recognize is Steve Alfaro. Steve, where are you? Steve is probably in the back. He makes Voto Latino beautiful. He designs a lot of this stuff. He volunteered for Voto Latino for a year and a half before I could afford him. He had a full-time job, and from 8 o'clock in the evening to 2, 3 o'clock in the morning, every single day for a year and a half, he would work with, with me. So Voto Latino was 1.1 person. <laughs> and finally, I was able to afford to, to recruit him. And Steve literally left a, a nice office from CTV and moved and worked with me at my kitchen table in DC. <laughs> I, would w I wish I'd been in that fly in that wall when he had that conversation with his parents, right? <laughs> so, so you're going where, to do what, to where? Anyway, um, the next group of folks that I'm going to introduce are individuals that I have worked with in the past that are exemplary of the Latino community and also who support youth programs in an incredible way. And the only way that we are able to be, to come together is because two of those individuals were f some of the first people that I met on that journey. The first person I'd like to recognize is Alejandra Campoverde, who is a California native, woohoo, a Harvard alum from the Kennedy School of, of Government, also from USC. She graduated uh, Kamal Lundande from the, uh, from the Annenberg Communications School of Journalism. She has been a special senior advisor to President Obama at the White House. You may have seen her most recently on Fusion, where she was a personal, uh, media personality, and has recently gone back to her roots and launched a nonprofit organization that tries to make sure that young people finish school are empowered through a model of mentorship. And I think so many times we get stuck in the road because we're the first one. I don't, how many people here are first generation? First generation. How many are your first to graduate from college? or in the process of, yeah, me too. And oftentimes you kind of get stuck in that road because you're the first person carving that path and you're not exactly sure what's next. And what Alejandra re recognized is the need for mentoring each other. So she has created a program where mentorship becomes a part of your everyday life. And I think something that we should always take away from this idea of mentorship is that mentorship doesn't necessarily have to be someone that's older than us. It could be our peer and it could be someone that's younger as well. So with that, Alejandra, thank you for your work. Please join us today in welcoming Alejandra Capo Verde. And you have to go around a ramp. <laughs> so you guys, if you guys could actually come this way and get ready for the ramp, otherwise it's going to be a long conversation. Muchas gracias, <laughs> Alejandra. The next person I'd like to recognize is Beatriz Trujillo. She is she's part of the Milpa Institute, and she basically is a motivational, motivating leadership for public advancement. And I have to say that I, these are my crib notes, and I can't read my own writing. My apologies. <laughs> <laughs> Beatriz. Beatriz is working in the critical aspect of it. Oftentimes, people say, when you ask a Latino parent if they want their kid to go to college, 98% of them say yes, according to the Pew. 98% say yes. If you ask their kid, do you want to go to college? 90% of those kids say yes. Yet we have an incredible gap. And the work that Beatriz is doing is helping close that gap by coaching not just young people, but their parents on how to become leadership within the school. That can't be more important work because what you do then, Beatriz, by doing that is that you are empowering a generation of La Familia to take care of themselves. So thank you for the work that you do, and thank you for the Cal Endowment for supporting that such critical work. So we always need friends in order to make big things, and sometimes those friends are individuals that have met you, met you before, but like the idea. This person basically was one of the first people that I met. He didn't really know me, but I said, you know what, Voto Latino, we're not officially a 501c3, meaning that the, the government hasn't given us a stamp to say that we can go ahead and become a charity. Will you funnel money for us? Completely legally. Basically what you, they do is that so you, I had to find a fiscal sponsor, someone that would basically manage the money on our behalf until the IRS said that we were okay. He didn't know me, and he said yes. I want to welcome to the stage the incredible James Cass, who is someone that has been part of the community, who has been a friend, 
we started, how many of you guys know Brave New Voices? Poetry Jams. It's this man right here. He started it. He also was the one that for the very first, oh, did I not see you right? <laughs> so he was also the, the, the individual that when Voto Latino launched our very first voter registration via text message, he's like, why don't you do it on HBO's Live at the Apollo and see how much traction you can get? I don't know about you guys, but that's the last place I ever imagined launching anything. Yeah. And it was one of the coolest experiences. James has had the opportunity to work with Robert Redford. He's taken the program of Youth Speaks internationally. But I think one of the coolest things that you've done is that he curated the first poetry jam session for the White House. That's not too shabby. For an amazing work, he is also, I know you, I know you hail from New York, but he got his MFA, his master's, at, Sa at Sa uh, San Francisco State, recognizing that what you do with an upper with a, with a degree allows you to open doors, not just for yourself, but for others. So thank you so much, James, for joining us today. And last but not definitely not least, someone who doesn't really need an introduction, the fabulous Dust Till Dawn, one and only. Wilmer Valderrama, are you in the house? <laughs> Wilmer is not only an incredible activist and friend, but he has dedicated his time, his off time, and I don't know, how much off time do you have? I mean, not very much, very little. He has, most, some folks know him as, you know, Handy Mandy, others know him as Fez, others know him as, know him as the, va the vampire on Dust Till Dawn. But our troops around the country know him as someone that has brought laughter and relief to the work that, that, for the suffering and the courage that they have abroad. He has traveled to Iraq, to Afghanistan, to talk to our troops, to inspire them. He's the Bob Hope of the Latino community. Is that true? <laughs> <laughs> and has also been an incredible mentor to many. So everyone, thank you so much. Please join me in this wonderful panel. I hope you guys have a fabulous time. And the mic goes to you. I actually think we're waiting for one more person, for Marcella to join us. From the California <laughs> down. The California. Maricela, so we had a, a, ch a change. We had one individual, Ricardo Lara, unfortunately. We had an upgrade. No, yeah. Unfortunately, wasn't able to join us. He had difficulty in his flight. And Maricela has been so gracious to, to talk about something that's very important in our community. Voto Latino has worked a lot on the health, the ACA, the Affordable Care Act. And while it has, it's done incredible strides in our community, for allowing people to provide to get health care. There's all a section of our families that don't necessarily have access. And those are uh, our undocumented brothers and sisters. And through the Cal Endowment and the Cartolada's work and the work that many, of you, many others here in California are doing is trying to pass legislation at the local level, at the state level, to address this, this important necessity. So Marisa, I thank you so much for your time and thank you for the work that Cal Endowment is doing. Can everyone hear me all right? Great. I am so excited to be here with all of you today and about this conversation with this distinguished panel, but also all of you young folks who, when you were raising your hands, talking about being the first in your family to go to school, I can identify with you, and I know all about that fire in your belly, and I'm so excited that you've chosen to use that fire to be able to help our own community and to push the issues that we know are so important because they affect our, our abuelitas and our moms and ourselves every single day. So thank you so much for being here. You know, when I was in the Obama campaign in 08, there was so many young people who got really excited about public service and all these issues. But you know, since those years, you see that the issues are something that continue to be important to young people. It's beyond a candidate. It's beyond any of that. It has to do with what's in our hearts and what it is that we believe is important. So thank you so much again for being here. Now, one of the things about all these issues that are important to us are, you know, how do we pay for it? And that might be something that is not as sexy to talk about, but it's a reality, you know, when we're talking about priorities in our state and in the way we budget the money that we have, the public funds. So the California Endowment has recently started a campaign called Do the Math, and in this campaign it's actually looking at exactly that, the priorities that we make and how it is that we spend this precious money. Um, in California, we have built 22 prisons since 1980, but we have only built one UC. 
And so when you look at how you spend your money and you think about the fact that what you invest in, that's what grows, what kind of message are we sending to young people and about our, our own priorities? So I want to ask you, Wilmer, you know, how important is it to invest in our education as far as, especially for our communities, how that is what opens the door to all of these opportunities for us? It's everything, you know, it's, <coughs> can you guys hear me okay? Yes, yes. Um, it, I think it's everything, you know, I think that we, one of the biggest things that we lack in our communities is the ability to understand that, that we have choices. And uh, in order for us to understand that we have choices, we, we have to have enough tools to create those, those, uh, those choices and, and create those, um, you know, those, uh, you know, those platforms. And I think that uh, the only tool um, is, you know, is education. So we, when, we look at, when we look at our communities uh, across the board, across the, the entire nation, we see the very common story that we all fall into the same jobs. We all fall into these thankless jobs. And, and sometimes some of our, our, our young people don't necessarily you know, uh, feel like certain opportunities are for them. Um, I think for me that that's the biggest, uh, that's the biggest thing. One is we have to reprogram our young community to understand that they are worth for that job, that they are worth that opportunity, and that they indeed, they, they, they do deserve that, that education. Um, but it also comes, it's a multi-generational conversation, right? Because we, like you said, you know, it comes from our abuelitas, from mama, papa, our tios, we, and they have to, they have to continue to support those young people to make those choices. But at the same time, those you know, young people themselves, and specifically now today with the access to technology and, you know, and, and, the, and the, the rest of the, you know, the, the tools that, that, that we're given today and how small the world is, you know, at one point, it's not your story, you know, who defines you. It's not your story or your background or your family who defines who you're gonna be. Um, you know, today we live in an age where, you know, you can follow your own path, you can create your own destiny, and that to me is 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 is, is the biggest gift we have today in society. That, and and the biggest gift of living in this country, is getting that education. So it's it's such a there's multiple categories for the conversation, you know what I mean? I think one is we, our parents need to make sure that our kids understand that there are choices out there. Two, you know, there needs to be a, a sense of, of uh, urgency to get that education. And then, you know, furthermore, when we talk about the prison system and all of that, they spend, you know, thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars in just keeping one inmate in there for very, very minor, minor uh, penalties, and I think that you know, if they were to redirect that funding and to create it more of a, an education of choice, you know, I think that, that you know, that, that could be definitely part of the solution. And you bring up a really good point about the amount of money spent on an inmate versus a student, and I actually want to give you guys the actual number. Mm -hmm. So right now, California spends 62300 a year per inmate and just 9100 a year per K-12 to student. So I want to ask you, Beatriz, you know, you work on the ground with students, and are you seeing the effect of this, and how do you think that the young, young folks take that? Yeah, definitely. I mean, just the fact that we are in a state in California that is really populated by immigrants, we got to understand that just having a general system, that it's really genetic for everyone, it's not going to comply with the needs of all the different students. We also need to take into consideration that the schools need to be a little more of a guide, not only for the students, but also for parents, because they're new to the system. They don't fully understand the system. And then we need to take a look at the demographics, how educated are our parents? Are they really familiar with any educational system? Not only the California educational system, but maybe their country of origin uh, educational system, they didn't know how that worked either. So we need a lot of money to not only educate our students on how the system works, but also educate our parents on how to support our students to work with the system, to make it to a higher education. Because that's a, one of the greatest limitants that I see, uh, not being able to navigate the system. No, oh, absolutely. You know, I know when I was going to school and trying to figure all this out, you don't know what you don't know. So how is it that you apply to schools? I remember I turned down my dorms because my mom thought they were just for international students. 
And I was like, okay, so I, I commuted my first year. So there's little things like that, you know, and much larger issues, but having the exposure to how it is you navigate this could be one of the biggest barriers of all. So I want to ask you, Maricela, I know that you, the California Endowment is really tackling this issue. Can you talk us through some of the specifics about why you're doing it and how? Sure, and um, yeah, you know, Beatriz is actually one of the youth in our communities. The endowment has 14 sites across the state. Um, four years ago or so, the endowment made a, a commitment to help uh, invest in some of the most underserved communities uh, across the state and have the local communities really kind of drive transformative change um, at the local level. Um, and one of my colleagues uh, mentioned this to me earlier, um, Albert, who's going to be speaking about our Sons and Brother works later on today. So that's another panel you guys should be checking out this afternoon. Um, in Fresno, our community got together and, uh, and directly spoke to our CEO and talked about the school to pipeline issue that was really starting to kind of rise up in our communities, meaning that there were harsh school discipline policies that were sending kids, they were either being suspended or um, ex expelled at higher levels and it was impacting our youth of color more and more, our, our boys and men of color more and more. And so the youth started asking these questions like, how can we address this issue? And that really started to uh, drive a conversation around, are our priorities straight, are our po policies right? Are they positively or negatively impacting our youth? And over the last couple of years, we've seen a rise in our youth like Beatriz who are pushing back you know, at the local level and at the state level saying these policies are sending us in the right, wrong direction. And so as you mentioned earlier, we're, we spend more on per inmate than per student. Uh, we're building more prisons than universities. Like that's crazy, right? Um, and so when uh, usually the first, um, the first barrier that youth face when they start having these conversations with policy leaders uh, at any level is, well, how are we gonna pay for it? We don't have the money for that. But when you start looking at like, well, hey, this is how much we're spending. Um, you know, are we spending it in the right way? And you know, um, as, we, as we mentioned earlier, like what you invest in grows. So if you're gonna be investing in uh, a school to pi a prison pipeline and more prisons, like what message are you sending our youth? And, um, so it's great to have um, our youth like Beatriz across the state who are starting to ask those questions. And so we actually have been helping to give um, a platform to the youth through this campaign, do the math, and uh, across um, California they've started to talk about like, well, if, we're, you know, if we spend this much per inmate, what else could we be spending on? So we're talking about like, well, maybe we can invest in like sending more kids to like space camp or hiring a school counselor or hiring more teachers. And you know, there's a number of things that you can start to think about and look at, you know, how could we best improve our youth's education and future if we had an opportunity to talk about how we could spend our money in a different way. Yeah, no, it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's amazing. I mean, just to kind of compliment what you're saying, it's something so unique. What, what, what you're saying that I think is so interesting is they're building more prisons, right? But now there's a, another business in the, in the prison system that is becoming very popular, and that is immigration holds, right? So now these are privately, privately built detention centers that they're not calling them prisons because they can't necessarily legally call them prisons because some of, most of the people in there have not committed a crime. So what, what's, what's really interesting is that there's millions, I mean hundreds of millions of dollars going into a very fast and booming business, which is immigration holds. And, and, and they're also made and created and built by the actual prison systems, which, which are also privately owned, and they're paid by the government. You know, the government you know, pays these privately owned prison systems a certain amount of money per inmate. You know, so it's, it's these contracts that are just so lucrative for some of these businesses that, you know, if, if we see in the rise of all these detention centers for young dreamers, you know, for young, you know, for, from families, you know, if we're seeing the rise of that, what do they know that we don't, right? What do they know that they're not telling us? Why, do, why are they investing hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars in detention centers and immigration holds 
if we're going to fix the immigration reform. You know, so, so there, I mean, and then, and then we go a come full circle to education, which, you know, to complement what you're saying. You know, I think at this point, you know, if we don't, if we don't infuse a sense of urgency into our young people and saying that if you don't get the education for, the, for your household, if you don't get the education, and I quote my dad when I first got to the United States back in 1994, I was 14 years old, 93, 13, 14 years old, I didn't know how to speak English, I didn't even know how to count to three at 13, 14 years old. Like any other immigrant, we came here to work, and my dad told me one thing that never, I never forgot, which was, I want you to get the education that we never had. I mean, they sacrificed, they sold everything. I mean, our family sacrificed and sold everything to come to America to just give us a shot at an education that they never had the privilege to have. So, you know, they, there's, there's this level of, of we, we lose it. Our time. Sometimes our families work so hard to just paying the rent and keeping food on the table that we forget that the young kids also need a little bit of motivation. But also those young kids are not so connected and so not exposed to the reality of what's happening in the household that it's hard for them to also appreciate you know, the struggles and the sacrifice. So as a family, we have to be more united. And as a, as a, as a, as a source of inspiration, we have to really encode the source of urgency in our kids. You know, because I really truly believe that that is really the ingredient we're missing. These young kids need to understand that they need not only education for themselves and for their future, but for the sake of their, their, their heritage, you know, for the sake of their family. And, and, this, and the sacrifice. It's really a pay and a tribute to the sacrifice that your parents made. But you know, I, I think that that's, that's one big issue that we need to address is you know, having them want to do it. And I think you're right, and I want to add something to that as well, because you know, a lot of times you know, we, we understand cerebrally, intellectually, that we want to do this, and we understand why it's important, but the confidence things comes into it. You know, applying to these schools, putting ourselves on a mic, sitting on a stage talking to other youth and and that's something that there may not be as many investments in teaching us to have that confidence within our community and so I actually want to talk to James about this because he started an organization Youth Speaks and it's about harnessing young people's voices to talk about issues so what brought you to start this organization and and how do you help people do this well I, I, I would like to just repeat the axiom too that what you invest in grows or what we invest in grows and so you know the basic formula is if we're investing in prisons and if we're investing in xenophobia and if we're investing in fear that's what grows and if we're investing in faith and belief in young people and if we're investing in education not necessarily what happens in schools because schools aren't always the safest place to get an education for many for many young people but if we're actually investing in the idea of love rather than fear then love is what grows so, you know, I started You Speaks here in 96 in California, and I don't want to spend too much time speaking about it, but it was in the height of a time where Prop 21 was on the horizon, Prop 187 were on the horizon, and there were multiple things going on that were really vilifying young people, particularly young people of color, and there were very few opportunities for young people, particularly young people of color, to speak about them in the media, other than very short sound bites that drove adult narratives. Um, adults had ideas and they got young people to sort of codify or sort of co-sign on those ideas in two second sound bites, but there were very few spaces for young people to have opportunity to speak thoughtfully about them in the media. And at the same time, it was like in the height of the, the Biggie and Tupac era, and so young people were just being totally vilified in the media across the board. Um, and I was in a graduate school getting a degree in creative writing. Um, in San Francisco State, which is an extraordinarily diverse campus, but that program was all white, and I should, make, should say that it's just interesting that the white guy on the panel got called out for the crim criminal activity by Maria, Maria Teresa. I just want to say, like, I'm the criminal element in the room right now. Yeah. Um, so it was extraordinarily lack of diversity in this program, and so I saw who was being groomed, for lack of a better word, to have voice. And I saw who didn't have voice in the national media and the national political dialogue, which is still true today in multiple ways. Um, and so what we try and do is we try and equip young people through arts education and youth development practices around the skill set to critically and creatively analyze the world and then just be able to present about it in really interesting, comprehensive, yet accessible ways in multiple public forums. Um, and the arts are a great tool for that. I think that one of the most important things, and I think that all of you have been speaking about it, is that if we're talking about civic engagement, whether it's the ridiculous numbers that we saw and sort of trying to combat the amount of money we put in criminalizing young people versus the amount of money we put in educating young people, um, 
it's important to know that your voice matters. And if you don't think that you matter or your voice matters, then why be engaged, right? So that the opportunity for you guys as sort of the next generation of leaders to matter is I think what's really important. And how do we move away from the polemical, diminished, debased public dialogue that's going on in the media and in the politics where people just set up, speak falsely by sort of media constructed talking points, but there's no opportunity for real engagement. So that's what we try and do. When we're talking about investments in education, you know, obviously an area that has been cut and cut and cut is arts education actually integrated within schools, K to 12. Talk to me about why that's so important that that's not the case. Yeah, I mean, No Child Left Behind really damaged the opportunity for teachers to have freedom in the classroom to work with young people's creativity. And um, I think there's a general myth that if we remove arts education, if we remove physical education, if we remove all of the things that help round out a young person's lives, young people are gonna be okay anyway. Because here's an extraordinary example of a young person who came from this community and look, he or she succeeded. And that's such a myth. Um, there's a recent study that I read recently that says, for a young person who comes from less than optimal circumstances, whether it's socioeconomic status or whatever, it takes 100 positive relationships to move that young person from a place that we might deem at risk to a place that we might deem successful. 100 relationships, this is 50 of whom are caring adults. So like, taking out the opportunities for teachers and students to engage with each other in the classroom in ways that get at who are you individually and what matters to you, and how do you talk about the world and what's going on in your life, which is what arts really allows for. It's just perpetuating this myth that, oh, kids are gonna be all right anyway, as long as they pass their math test, all is cool. You know, before we pivot into healthcare, I wanna see if the video is prepped that we can watch, if we're all set with that. Here we go. Now, Wilmer, we've seen, we've been pivoting to healthcare. We've seen that this is the first open season of enrollment for Obamacare, for the Affordable Care Act. And you know, the Latino community is a community especially been affected as an uninsured community. And we've made huge strides on this. And I know Voto Latino is doing a lot of work around this as well. So I was wondering if you could talk to that for a moment. Yeah, absolutely. I think our biggest, um, you know, this, this all started with with the challenge that most people just didn't have the information to make their own uh, choice. You know, that sometimes they just didn't have the, the ability to, to, uh, to make an educated, you know, a choice for not only themselves, but their family. And uh, what we wanted to do was to, to make as much information as possible, make it as easy as possible for people to understand what does it mean to make this choice and this choice. Um, you know, and, and we were more, more emotionally driven to, to just get people to understand that, you know, they, they, one, they do have a voice, two, they have a platform, but three, they can make a choice that can really last, you know, a lifetime for their families. And when it came to this issue, for us, it was, was important for them to understand what it meant. Because most of our families, the way that sometimes you, you, you see politicians, you know, debate on the matter, you see, you see the government explain you know, what it means to the country to do this, in numbers, and money, and this, and you know, how much money it'll save here, how much money it'll save there. That doesn't translate to the emotional investment that somebody at home would actually have to actually make the right choice. And, and that was the biggest disconnect. And the first, you know, first, you know, strike, and strike two and strike three of, of this conversation, as, as the campaign rose, everyone thought, okay, well, if we tell them how much money the country is gonna save, or how much, money is gonna go towards this, you know, benefiting this and this and this, maybe it'll trigger some kind of emotional uh, investment. Well, they were wrong. I mean, I think that, that the idea was to have them understand that, that in order for people to actually move, and, and for us as a Latino community, we have to be so emotionally and passionately invested into the matter for us to actually say, hey, you know what, this, this matters to me, or you know what, this will affect my family. But they didn't, they didn't really, we didn't really have the examples, and I think that for us as a platform, what we try to do the, the best we, we could was to provide them with as much information so they themselves can develop a real opinion. And you'll hear that a lot um, in our platform and, and when what we've done with Voto Latino is it's empowered you to have a real opinion, um, a real opinion that is based on facts. There were facts that were, uh, that were simple, that they were told uh, to you, 
um, with the vocabulary and the language and, and the conversation that you can come with. And I think that that, that, was, uh, that was one of the biggest elements of success for, for our organization when it came to this matter. Is, is, and, and then the other, the other side of the, the, the phase two of that, aside from creating a conversation that they could understand, was now finding them. Where can we bring this conversation to them, right? So then we utilize every tool possible that they would have. We, we acquire, which by the way, the government is probably five years late to this, but we were 10 years ahead of it, which was like we identified that between Twitter and Facebook and MySpace at the time, you know, that we would, you know, that we would be able to actually connect to the core audience, you know? So we became a liaison between the issues and the causes and the people. Uh, and we were able to speak as people, as opposed to a politician preaching a cause. And I think that, that that's, that's why I think it was a successful formula. Also, we, you know, we utilize every bit of technology as it evolves. And sometimes we try to stay ahead of it by also uh, bringing in programs. Like right now we have the Innovators uh, uh, Challenge, which is you know, we're putting about $500,000 to new ideas and empowering young Latinos to, to aim towards, towards tech jobs. You know, the, the average uh, salary is $70,000 a year. And, we, and only 7% of Latinos are aiming for those type of jobs, right? So for us, it's like, okay, well, how can we empower the community to look at all the jobs as, as obtainable? You know, so, so we're looking at what are, those, what are those platforms? What are those platforms that are gonna make it easier for us to connect to one another on a faster level, have a shorter, shorter hand, and really <laughs> convey the emotional uh, triggers that, that would turn into some kind of engagement? Um, and that's, that's what we've done as uh, some organization. You know, those emotional triggers are, are so much more dynamic, I feel, in communities such as our own because I don't, I've had situations where I've had my aunt fall and break her leg and be like, but I can't go to the, I can't go to the hospital, I have insurance. You know, and I think for a lot of other communities, it's hard to comprehend that, yes, we can talk about the, the kind of wonkiness and, and the savings and all of that, but when we're talking to our parents and letting them know, letting them know about these issues, it is, there's an emotional core to all of that that I think that we have an opportunity and the responsibility as young folks to bring that forward. Mm -hmm. And the endowment on the other end is investing the money as a large foundation, as a capacity, and you have a campaign health for all, and I'd love to hear more about that. Right, um, and the endowment's you know, core mission is to help expand access to affordable health coverage um, you know, to people in California. Uh, and so when the Affordable Care Act or the Obamacare, um, you know, was, you know, uh, starting to really kind of build up, we stepped in and said, we need to make this a priority in California and we need to help educate, um, you know, our families because we know that the hardest thing um, can be sometimes is to get people to enroll. It's complicated. The systems that we face, you know, aren't friendly. Um, and so... Uh, we made a huge investment in helping to get Latinos to enroll, and that was, you know, we, we made a very, um, you know, purposeful, like, uh, decision to invest our resources in driving really mainly a Latino-based strategy where we wanted to get uh, Latinos to get enrolled into affordable health coverage based on, like, the new, you know, new opportunities that were out there. Um, you know, 60% uh, of those who were eligible but uninsured were Latinos, so the numbers told us, like, Here's where you need to go, and so um, you know. Last year, we got over 2.2 um, 2 million um, Californians enrolled into Medi-Cal, um, and that wasn't you know, you know, that wasn't just coincidence. It was a fact that a lot of um, organizations and people came together um, to partner and really reach the Latino community. So, you know, we invested into partnerships with Univision and with like. Power 106, like whatever made sense to reach um, the Latino community, you know, we, we, we did it, uh, our best effort to do so. And so we, we saw success and now, this, now the challenge is gonna be, um, let's make sure that everyone that got enrolled stays enrolled. Um, and so you guys can be messengers on that too. Um, you know, you, you know with, start with your family and then you know, branch out to your community. Um, but from there, we also um, n recognized that there were still going to be millions of Californians that were going to be left uninsured. They weren't going to have access to have affordable care. And so we invested also efforts into creating the Health for All campaign, uh, which is 
to a, really an educational campaign that's uh, raising awareness that 1.4 million Californians um, will be locked out of health coverage because of their immigration status. So undocumented Californians um, lack access to health coverage. And it's an issue for our community, uh, whether you're undocumented yourself or you live in a, in a family with mixed status, we know that that creates a lot of hardship um, you know, within our families, within our communities. And we also raise the issue that undocumented Californians are working. They're working hard. They contribute to our community. They contribute to our economies. Uh, they contribute to you know, um, Social Security, and they'll never see any of those benefits. And um, so we, we're raising a lot of these facts um, and saying, you know, we need a solution. Um, and there's communities uh, at the local level that are rising up and, and you know, trying to make change locally. In, in LA, we saw an investment to try and cover more of the undocumented communities. But you have communities like in Fresno where you have um, you know, the local board of supervisors who are saying, like, we can't afford it. Um, we can't cover them. We're not going to do it. And the reality is, if you take away um, and you don't provide access to health coverage to everyone, um, that's when you start seeing um, expenses, expensive ER rooms. So whether you like it or not, we're all paying um, for you know, ER visits. And you know, when, when you can't take care of a problem that's small and it grows, um, then you end up paying the bigger price. And so that, again, we, we come back to the issue of do the math. Do we want to invest our money the smart way and be able to provide preventive care to our families? Or do we want to kind of wait and, and, and have a system that's broken, that doesn't work, and that is not fair? So uh, more and more we're seeing that um, attitudes, attitudes in California are changing. We, we did a, a poll recently where we saw that a majority of Californians believe it's the right thing to do to expand access to affordable health coverage to the undocumented. And so a lot of that also you know, is, is our youth speaking up. Youth also, by a big part, uh, were saying that they believe in expanding access to health coverage. And you're starting to see that it's not just an issue um, that's moving sort of Democrats. You're starting to see more youth that are moving to, to say that they're independent. You're starting to see Republicans that are saying, like, you know, I, I get the cost issue, like it doesn't make sense that we're spending more in, in the ER visits. This is a problem. So no matter, you know, this is an issue that crosses uh, party lines. It's an issue that our youth care about. It's an issue where more and more people are saying it's the right thing to do. We need to figure out how to invest our money in a smart way. Another one of these issues is the minimum wage. And so I want to ask you, Beatriz, you know, you're on the ground with folks, and California has a higher minimum wage than the federal one, but there's still a lot of local efforts going right now to raise that. What are you hearing from young people about how this affects them personally? Well, especially because the area that I work on, it's um, a lot of agricultural um, work. Like, everything is done at the fields with the minimum wage, or sometimes not even that, because people, people who pick up a strawberry, they don't even get the minimum wage. It's based on what they can produce so that they can get extra money. But regarding the minimum wage, um, coming from a family who it's not from a high income, it's a low income family, and having to face not only, or the results that I see of having such a, this minimum wage is that the people who work at the fields, especially, I'm gonna make reference at the people who work at the fields because this is the people that I'm exposed to, the people that I work with. Um, when they get, when they have some time, or let, okay, let me set this example. When I was working with uh, elementary students and they were taking the CSTs, they were asked on the English portion of it, they were asked to develop an essay out of a prompt. I think the prompt was going ice skating or something like that, but the students have never done it. So on top of the language barrier, you're also adding something that they haven't been exposed to. Why? Because parents cannot afford to that. Because either when you have the time, which is the winter time, they're unemployed. And to add to that issue, some parents don't get unemployment because they are undocumented. So they have to save during the good season, which is the summer season, so that they can, they, they can make it through the hard season, which is the winter season, and then just, you just get the students not really knowing what's out there. 
And then we go to this issue where they don't le really feel like they belong to the community. So I think raising the minimum wage will be a support for them because it's not even working less hours, but having enough to survive, enough to at least do a few activities out in the community and feeling part of that community because people don't speak up because they don't feel like they're mm. part of the community. I mean, you're talking about immigrants who are you not know, seen as part of it. And you come to the country or our parents come to this country thinking that they're gonna go back to their country of origin. So from the beginning, they know that they don't belong here. Mm. And now they cannot expose themselves to what it's available out there for them. Mm -hmm. So this is a bigger limitation. The more you look at it, it's deeper and deeper and deeper. And it's, 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 uh, just to uh, piggyback on what you're, what you're saying, you know, complement what you're saying, uh, undocumented workers uh, provide billions of dollars to the economy, billions of dollars to Social Security that they themselves will never see. And so nobody talks about this fact. Nobody talks about the fact that, oh, okay, well, let's get all this, you know, there, there's all these really ignorant statements out there, like, we don't support this, we don't support that, we gotta get them out of here. But then, you know, then you're losing mil billions and billions of dollars in the economy that you're using, uh, you know, because it's there, because it's just, no, they're never gonna actually collect it. They're not gonna, see, it's in the system because they're producing it. Really. And then to your point, I mean, I have, um, I'm really close to the Polynesian community as well. And, you know, these are islanders, right? So it's Samoan and Hawaiians and all that stuff. And, and this, there's a big Samoan uh, community in Carson, uh, in Carson, uh, Los Angeles. And um, what's happening over there is interesting because kids grow up into their 20s and 30s over there and they've never been to the beach. Mm -hmm. In Los Angeles, these are islanders. Okay? I mean, these this guys are from the island. <laughs> you know what I mean? They, they, my, one of my best friends, his name is Tadao Salima, and Tadao is uh, Samoan. You know, and some of the inner city programs that we do out there, you know, the, we're trying to get schools to get the school buses, you know, to take these kids to the beach for the first time. And it's unbelievable what, what happens. They're like, wow, that's a lot of water. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? It's the most beautiful thing to see. And they get inspired to travel a little bit. And it's so funny. They could take a bus from Carson, take a bus, ride a bus all the way to the beach and come home and they've never done it. You know? So it's, 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 it's inspiring the young people and it's getting this information out there and saying like, yo, there's, there's, this, <laughs> there's this misconception about undocumented workers, there's this misconception about the word immigration, that is just so, it's just so misguided and so ignorant, you know, that, that it's made this conversation so difficult, you know? And therefore, these programs are not looked at, and then therefore it's harder to convince communities to actually get involved, because you're right, they don't feel like they, they belong. They don't feel like they actually have a, a, a seat at the table. When that seat at the table is actually providing you know, the funding for the table. You know what I mean? It's, 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 it's there's such a disconnect. I, and I can see how much these issues are important to everyone, because as I'm looking around as everyone's speaking, I see all these nodding faces. You know, I know this is very important. And I want to direct this to James, because, you know, how can we make sure that all of our voices are heard on this? How can young people get their voices out there? Well, I think, so first of all, like, like look around the room. Like actually, you guys, look around. Look at the room you're sitting in. Like most of you are considerably younger than I am and it's a pretty fly room, <laughs> right? Like the future of the United States is pretty fly, if we let it be. And like the future, is, everyone talks about the future, but the future is rarely in the conversation. And that's a really important thing. Um, and I don't know if, if it's because we live in this overanalyzed world right now where everything in the political world is geared to a point where like, I think it's great in some ways that because of who I am and where I live and what my shopping <coughs> habits are and what my socioeconomic status is and what my family cultural history is and what my marital status is and what my job is, somebody can pretty much guess with pretty good accuracy what I'm gonna vote for. And I guess that's great if I'm considered a customer to somebody's message or a customer to somebody's image. But I don't want to be a customer to somebody's message or somebody's image, particularly if that message and image 
is created in a group based on polls, and it's sort of just this, let's create something that people are gonna be attracted to based on the specific demographic that we're targeting. And I doubt that most of you are interested in that either. I think what we're most interested in is honesty, and like actually engaged conversation. And I think in order, and I think it's really important, particularly with what you're saying, it's like, think about who are the silenced. Who are the most silenced people living in the United States right now, whether they're here temporarily or they've been here for generations and generations? And how important it is to make visible the invisible voices. And what's the moral imperative that each one of us in this room and beyond have to speak? Like, if we're not satisfied with the current state of things, what is our moral imperative to speak on that? Do you know what I'm saying? And I think, like, you know, people pack, want to package millennials. Oh, millennials think this, and Latino millennials think this, and black millennials think this. And that's like, I can only speak from my experience when I was that person in my early 20s and I was Gen X. I hated that. Like, maybe there were some larger truths to it, but I didn't want to be a prepackaged commodity for you to sell or sell to. And so there's a space, I think, that calls upon you to speak from your life experience and from the data and the knowledge that you gain. But your experiential knowledge matched up with the facts and figures of the world, like these statistics right there. Like the CEOs make $5,000 per hour and minimum wage earners are $9 an hour in California. Like it's important to know that data and it's important to hold individuals and systems equally accountable. But in order for us to do that, we need to call upon all of our own experiential knowledge and bring that forth right into the conversation. Do you know what I'm saying? Like silence is a beautiful thing when we choose to be silent. But throughout history, silence has also been the most oppressive force used in most oppressive systems and societies. And so what is your moral imperative to speak and not to, as I said earlier, not to further somebody else's narrative about you, but to actually move into the center of conversations I recognize that the voice of 21st century America is pretty fly if we give it the space to be fly. You know what I'm saying? That didn't answer your question, maybe. No, I like no, it, I, it did <laughs> for me. I hope it did for you. I mean, I, I know that I say fo to folks that, you know, sometimes our experience is pain, and sometimes our career and our passion and our life's yeah. journey comes from a position of pain, and that's okay. You know, that can be a driving force, and that could be uh, something to share with people that really makes a difference. Hey, now, can I just say one thing too, because I don't want to, I, I want to make sure that I'm not asking folks either to speak on behalf of the silence. It's like, what can you do? What can each one of us do to provide space for the silence to speak? Because I think something different. I think that's what you do. Yeah. <laughs> I want to direct the last question to Wilmer. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Monday is a very important day. It's the last day here in California to register for to vote. And what will you say to folks that don't think that their voices are heard? Well, uh, so many things I like to say to those people. Um, but I will say this: the message is simple. You know, I think a lot of people there's there's a couple of misconceptions and there's a couple of really misguided thoughts from non-voters and. and people that have registered to vote, and you're gonna, you're gonna experience this, and they're gonna ask you flat out to your face, and you're gonna be stunned by the, by the, by, um, by the statement, which is, it's one vote, right? Like, well, what's the, my vote doesn't count, it doesn't matter, you know, you know, somebody else is gonna vote the same, so why would I vote, you know? What people don't understand sometimes is, most times, is that the doubt vote, one, most often, times and none, that vote represents your household because sometimes your entire family is not voting. So if you don't vote, your entire family did not have a seat at the table, right? So, so, so that vote represents your household sometimes. Imagine if you can get your entire household that's eligible to, to vote, to go out and vote. Now you got four, five, six votes in one household. That's actual real, that's, that's a real community. That's a real, uh, this real civic engagement, you know? Imagine if your whole household go out and vote, that's five votes, six votes, whatever it is. So that's a misconception. The other one misconception is, is oh, what's well, one, one vote? What, what, what's one vote gonna do? But sometimes that vote represents thousands and thousands and thousands of people don't have the privilege to speak for themselves, to stand on a stage and say what well, the things that matter. 
they don't have the privilege to actually be, be able to go out there and let their voice be heard as much as they want to scream out loud, you know, hey, I've been working this hard. I've been doing this much. I am a dreamer, but I can't vote. Mm. So sometimes that vote defends the values of your heritage, defends the values of your culture, but, but really to the core of it, gives your entire sacrifice and your story respect. It should be, a, you, got, you have to be proud of that vote. If, you don't, if you're not proud of that vote, then get out. Then don't complain. Then don't say it doesn't work. That's why I'm not going to get engaged. I mean, or, or you know what, I'm pissed at the government. That's why I'm not voting. That's so stupid. Hear yourself out loud. Oh, I hate the government, this and this. They don't speak, listen, they don't speak to us, Republicans and Democrats and this and whatever, blah, so I'm not going to vote. Like, that's like... That's like, and I said this yesterday, and I think some of you guys were there yesterday, but it's a great, interesting analogy. It's like, sometimes we get often, and, uh, and I'll say it again if you guys didn't hear it, but if you heard it yesterday, I'm going to repeat it again. Sometimes when we ask people to vote, it's like we're asking them to take the trash out, right? They're like, oh, uh, um, oh I didn't know I had to take the trash out today. <laughs> oh, you, you, didn't ask, you didn't ask me to take the trash out. Are you kidding me? Like, it's your house. Are you going to live with trash in the house? So guess what we have to do? When we vote, we continue to take the trash out of the house. Out of the house. <laughs> I mean, it's very simple. And I might even say, and, and yesterday we had an interesting conversation at the Google Hangout where someone brought Prop 187. Prop 187 was one of those moments in time where the community, for the first time in a very long time, bounded together under one message and went out there and voiced their opinions, marched and, 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 and protested against that. We united then, and then we went back to waving different flags. Right? We went back to segregating ourselves and therefore we became invisible again. They're like, whoa, look at how many Latinos in the streets. <laughs> and then they disappeared. Well, with immigration reform, we live in that moment again. We have now been pushed forward. We have now, we, uh, backwards. We have now been told to take a seat for a second while the big boys uh, speak at the table when we are the designative vote, when we are the actual swing vote, when we are the vote that they need to actually secure a future for their party. Think about that. The Republicans and Democrats won't be anything unless they engage with us. Unless they're with us, they're not gonna actually succeed. The history and the future of their parties relies on our vote. So if we don't vote, if we don't go out there and convince our families, if we don't vote and we tell, we tell uh, you know, let's represent the house or let's pay tribute, let's be proud of the fact that we have made sacrifices to be here just like anybody else. By just one simple, like one hour of your day on that faithful day mm -hmm. that you get out, out of your house and represent your family and represent the thousands of people that have suffered, that have died mm -hmm. overseas, that have families being deported, that now they have to take three other jobs in order for, to send them money and keep them alive in, in a country where they have nothing going on for themselves. Like, think about that. If you don't vote, mm. then who are you? Why are you here? Mm. So I think for me, the, 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 biggest, the biggest advice I can give anybody who, who, who comes across this, this, this struggle is to remind them that Who's gonna take the trash out if it's not you? Mm. you know? that, that to me is as simple as that. Well, I'd like to thank our distinguished panel for all their inspiring words and for all the work that they do. Thank all of you guys for being a part of this conversation. And I know I can speak for all of us that seeing all of you here is so exciting for us. And we hope you have a wonderful day. Cool.